In this video, we're gonna talk about energy flow through ecosystems. I wanna make first uh, very clear the contrast between how energy moves and how matter or stuff moves. Energy is a one-way flow. And if we think about maybe us first, that makes sense. If we think about sort of the only way we obtain energy as humans is by eating food. Um, and then um, as we burn calories, the energy sort of leaves us as heat. And if I burn 500 calories on a treadmill, um, the only way I can recover those calories is to eat 500 calories of food. So energy is a one-way flow um, in contrast to stuff. The actual atoms, if we were to trace them moving around an ecosystem, can be recycled. And I'll cover that in a different video. So here I just want to focus on energy flow. And this looks like a very complicated diagram, but it really is just trying to lay out how energy generally enters a, a community and how it leaves. And so we see that maybe in photosynthetic communities, at least, which is most communities, um, certainly all communities on land and, and um, sort of at the surface of oceans, um, and most aquatic bodies are photosynthetic communities um, where organisms are able to take light energy and convert it into what I'm just broadly calling biomass here. So biomass is just stored energy, stored calories, um, stored in the molecules that make up your body. So carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids would all be kind of like biomass here. Okay. Um, and um, all organisms constantly are spending some of that biomass, and we'll make clear what, why they're doing that. Um, and when they spend that biomass, some of the energy is also being um, produced as heat whenever you convert energy from one form to another, say from carbohydrates to ATP. And so that heat energy is how um, um, energy leaves uh, living organisms and why we all constantly need to replace calories because we're constantly spending them. And so that's what creates the one-way flow. Um, if we were to think about um, autotrophic producers, um, we could think of them as either being photosynthetic, converting light into molecules like carbohydrates, or at least the energy, okay? So the energy of light into the energy of stored carbohydrates. Um, but I just wanna remind you as well that there are chemosynthetic communities, especially on the ocean floor. They're able to cut up other chemicals like hydrogen sulfide and turn them into something else and that gives them the energy to build carbohydrates um, and store the energy in them. Okay, so, um, and then there are heterotrophic consumers. Sometimes we organize them into different trophic levels, like primary consumers who, who primarily eat uh, the, the, the producers themselves. We have the herbivores or the secondary level consumers who eat the primary consumers, the tertiary consumers who eat the secondary consumers. Um, and maybe even fourth level, you're, you're fine calling them fourth level consumers or third level consumers instead of tertiary, um, however you would like to think about that. Um, and we get our energy by digesting the biomass of other organisms, cutting their molecules up into little monomers, and then maybe just through biosynthetic pathways in our cells, reassembling them into um, the, the versions of polymers that we want. Um, if I were to eat a cow, I wouldn't want literal cow proteins inside my cells. I would just cut those cow proteins up into amino acids and then reassemble those amino acids into human proteins. Okay, so if we were to think about um, how much biomass of each type of, of organism, of each type of trophic level might we find out there in an average community, maybe the pyramid would look something like this. And maybe this kind of makes a, a kind of intuitive sense. Um, if I were to go out into a prairie, I would see lots of grass, um, not quite as many grasshoppers, um, definitely fewer rats and even fewer snakes. And maybe I just see um, a very few hawks kind of flying around um, looking for organisms to eat. So certainly it makes an intuitive kind of sense that there's the most of the lowest trophic level. Um, and we have kind of a more uh, fancy way of summarizing that. Um, we can think of uh, what we sometimes call the rough rule of tens. This is not a perfect principle, this is not an exact principle, but we kind of estimate that maybe roughly only about 10% of all of the energy that was ever in a particular trophic level is actually available as biomass ready to be consumed by organisms in the next trophic level up. Maybe only 10% of the energy ever available to grass is actually um, currently available to grasshoppers to eat. And maybe only 10% of the energy ever available to grasshoppers is actually available to the 
um, uh, the rats that eat the grasshoppers or whatever I, I had um, in that, that last slide. And so maybe 90% of all the total energy has already left those organisms as heat. Um, and it's unavailable. You can't eat heat um, uh, as a way of keeping you alive. And so let's make sure we're clear on why. Where, why 90%? Where did all that energy go? Well, don't forget that I made a video in the um, energetics unit talking about how organisms spend their energy. Um, we, we said that all organisms grow, reproduce, and maintain homeostasis. And I just want to um, come back to that to say that really only growth um, would represent um, activity that organisms spend energy doing um, that is actually available to the next trophic level that if you spend energy putting together polymers, um, building new cells through mitosis, um, that kind of investment is available to the next trophic level to eat. But energy that you spend, say, winning mates or making reproductive cells or even producing new offspring, but you know, then the energy is in them, the offspring, it's no longer in you. You've already spent that energy. And certainly energy spent maintaining homeostasis, uh, doing active transport in your cells, or moving if you're an animal, running away, um, or immune defense, building a, um, a bunch of lymphocytic white blood cells to fight off a disease. Um, that's energy that you're, you've already spent, um, and so it's unavailable to the, to the next trophic level because um, all of that energy you're spending is generating a lot of heat that is leaving your body. And so again, if we look at that energy pyramid, we, we might estimate that again, um, all the energy contained within one trophic level, maybe only 10% of that is actually available to the next trophic level because you're doing a lot of other things, reproducing, maintaining homeostasis, um, that, that organisms can't access um, and eat. So it creates this energy pyramid, and that's going to create different carrying capacities for different trophic levels. And that's why we see so much grass at the, at the lowest trophic level. And then we see a lot of herbivores, but relatively few carnivores. Um, because their carrying capacity, with all the energy that's available to them, creates a much lower population size potential than for lower trophic levels. Okay, so um, I think we've kind of broadly tried to summarize the idea of energy flow, a one-way travel of energy. The, the constant need for new sunlight coming in, for photosynthetic ecosystems anyway, um, that renews energy. Um, we don't directly take in light energy ourselves, but it, it, it um, goes to the producers who then their biomass is available to consumers. Um, and so you can summarize this as a one-way flow through ecosystems. Um, and that um, uh, for most of us, for most communities, uh, Energy is flowing in as sunlight and leaving as heat.